Okay. Um, as far as I know, this is recording, and also I figured out that if I um, have the camera set to 720p, I should be able to use the zoom function. Function, so that should help, especially when we we start getting into uh, looking at the counters. A few things I do want to mention off before uh, uh, I go into the rules. Um, is that I will be using my map, which is, uh, well, of course, all these maps are blown up. Uh, over here, you can see, like, even this one is a, uh, not the real one here. Um, but this is kind of like the unedited version, if you would say, like, color-wise, of the one that, uh, that came with the original Spence and Gable. Um, as you can see, it's a two-color map works perfectly fine i just wanted to clean it up a bit you can see there's uh i think you can over here there's um some stains and stuff like that so all i've done so far is uh for the oh shoot my bingo chip fell off it doesn't really matter i was using the bingo chip to show uh the progress of what i've been doing i've been using that uh website i think i mentioned previously um hex tml yeah, I think it's um, primarily for things such as like Dungeon Crawler or like, you know, the old Ultima type games. But uh, I'm using it for this uh, just for my own sake. But anyways, I just used MS Paint. I've just uh, cleaned it up and enhanced some of the colors a little bit just for me. Um, also, uh, when I go to show you the CRT and the terrain effects, I, all I've done is taken uh, Spence and Gable's actual... Um, as you can see here, I've taken their actual one and just uh, cut and paste, like I scanned it, cut and pasted, and got rid of the turn uh, record track for them and the reinforcement uh, schedule, and just uh, made my own. That's all. That's all I've done. So we'll I'll, we'll be using this, uh, this, um, my enhanced map, as well as. Um, when we get to the counters and I start doing my stuff, <coughs> excuse me, we'll be also using my counters. Um, just due to the fact, and they're the middle ones, um, they're not great. Here, let's see if I can use the um, that zoom function I was mentioning. There we go. Maybe one more. Okay, I think that's it. That's. Uh, and I'm not sure, I'll check the, uh, I'm getting the, the, the focus right. Hold on. I may not be getting the focus. Let's see if I can get it a bit better. Uh-huh, hold on. I think that's a bit better. I, I'm just, uh, I find often it does that weird uh, there, let's just hope for the best. And uh, but anyways, it'll be more. Uh, yeah, that's not great either. But uh, I'll figure out something. Yeah, so I'll be using uh, the counters in the middle, and like I said, they're not great either. Um, but it, hopefully, uh, it's for me to be able to manipulate. You'll see, like these counters are really thin. Uh, the, this video will not uh, be about the comparison of the. Um, uh, the counters. I'll do a separate one for that. Um, I just want to basically read the rules, but we will. Uh, I will pop on over here when we do uh, start reading the rules because uh, they have a graphic, um, you know, showing you the um, like uh, uh, what all these things are. So, anyways, hold on. I'll move that off to the side, and of course, we'll also be looking at the map because uh, um, uh, the rules. You know, uh, talk about um, uh, the separation between the Russian First Army and the Second Army, like uh, set up and so on and so forth. And anyways, there we go. We'll get back out to that. And now I'll bring up the rules. And all I did with the rules as well, when I read them off to the side, I um, see they're just three pages. Uh, all I did was uh, yet again I scanned the rules. Um, and then cropped as much as I could within reason, you know, without uh, spending too much time kind of thing. 
and then uh, so that way hopefully that'll help you guys out while I'm reading them out because uh, I don't want to look down kind of thing and then you can uh, see what I'm reading if that makes any sense I hope and then I'll go uh, when we see things that mention uh, sp specific stuff for the map uh, we'll go down that road and we'll see uh, how it goes all right hold on I'm just moving some stuff off to the side I just deal with my um, whatever map I'll put that off to the side as well and page two and three all right and I'll move the bingo chit and the CRT there we go okay and I'll bring the thing out again and I'll go for page one and I'll zoom it a bit and then like I said when we have to get into whatever we'll do it okay hold on here you doing it there we go There we go. Okay. I think that's about it because I want you to, you know, we'll see the whole page and whatever. All right. And I can start reading without uh, having a stoop or what have you. And we'll see how this goes. So, introduction. In August 1914, two Russian armies lumbered into German East Prussia. Their goal was to sever East Prussia from the rest of Germany and trap or destroy the German 8th army defending it. Urged by the French to relieve pressure in the west, the Russians moved before their awkward logistical system was ready. The advance itself was plagued by confusion, poor staff work, and poor reconnaissance. The Germans completed abandoning East Prussia, but patriotic zeal and a new commander, von Hindenburg with Lund and Ludendorff, brought about a determined defense. Railing the bulk of the German forces from the front of First Russian Army near uh, Gumbinen, they sent them south to the flanks of the Second Russian Army. This army was surrounded and most of it captured in what was called a modern Kanai. This game is a brigade division level simulation of the first 30 days of the East Prussian campaign. The map covers the area over which the campaign was fought, and the playing pieces, henceforth called units, represent the military units which fought or could have fought in the, in the battles. Each hex represents three miles from side to side, and each turn represents one day of actual time. Each Tannenberg game should include the following. A game map, set of unit counters, rules folder, a game table sheet, one die not included is also needed. Unit counters. I'll pop one on. And we'll use theirs. I'll just grab one. So this is the Russian 36th. I'll put it off here. So how's that? Yeah, it's not out here. I'll put it in the woods. All right. So each unit counter represents a specific military unit and contains information concerning that unit. The very top is the unit size the XX, as you know, for a division. Uh, uh, the middle bit is the unit type, so as uh, using NATO symbols. The unit, uh, the number on the right going down is the unit designation. Uh, the number on the left is combat strength, and the number on the right is movement factor. Uh, unit type, uh, like I said, uh, X for infantry, and the slash is for cavalry. Unit size, XX for division, X brigade. Unit designation, the historical name of the unit. Combat strength, the unit's overall efficiency in attack and defense. And the movement factor is the maximum number of hexes a unit may traverse in a single movement phase. There's also abbreviations. Uh, G for guard, uh, F for finish, R for reserve, RF for rifle, LW for landwehr, BDK for broiduk. BSE for Buse, B-U-S-S-E, uh, DZG is uh, Danzig, uh, GDK is uh, Gaiduk, G-E-I-D-U-K, KG is Konigsberg, E is Ersatz, and IND is Independent. Um, play sequence. After both sides have set up their units, see initial setup, which, uh, oh, I love it when they do things like that. 
the game begins and a marker should be placed in the first game turn box on the turn record track. And like I said, we'll be using um, uh, my thing over there. You don't really need to see it, but you get the idea. And we are starting on the 17th of August and the last turn is the 15th of September. Okay. There's lots of reinforcements in this game. Uh, where did I, where am I here? Each game turn is divided into consecutive Russian and German player turns. The Russian turn is always first. Each player turn is subdivided into three distinct phases. Supply judgment phase. Hold on, I'm going to grab some water. <clears throat> the, play, the facing player determines the supply state of his units for the current turn. See supply. Hope you don't mind, but I'm, uh, when I see his, I'm just going to turn it to they. It's not because I'm some politically correct freak or whatever. Um, uh, I'm just, uh, it just drives me up the effing tree because uh, maybe it's because I have a daughter, the whole nine yards, but it, it just drives me up the tree, man. So, like, I think about her and I'm like, no, man, no, not happening. So, uh, next uh, phase, movement phase. The phasing player moves any or all of their units. See movement. Combat phase. The phasing player conducts and resolves attacks. See combat. Movement. Units are moved by tracing a path through the hex grid. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you obviously can see both. I mean, Jeepers jumping. Um, Units expend their movement factors to enter hexes, the cost of which varies according to terrain. See the terrain effects chart. Okay, let's go to that then. One as well. You see that? Yep. So there we go. We've got clear, forest, swamp, river, lake, sea, uh, rail town and miscellaneous and you can see it's got the one two the three and the four and a lot of this has got to do uh, well some of it's got to do with fortifications and uh two different types of forts uh ring forts and well we'll get to it in, well here and a detached fort this is right there so and and then you see the border bit as well okay so we got there and you got minus. Oh, I love this also too. It's very interesting. Uh, maybe there, there's other game systems. Remember, I'm naive. Um, I don't have like a big uh, extensive uh, library in my head of it or experience playing a lot of games. So like uh, other people will be like, oh, that's a common whatever. But to me, I'm like, ooh, it's kind of neat that it's minus one for retreats in these little things and so on and so forth. It's, you know, causes some interesting wrinkles anyways. Uh, movement costs are cumulative. If a unit does not have enough movement factors remaining to enter a hex, it may not uh, do so. However, a unit may always move at least one hex per movement phase, except to move from one enemy controlled hex to another. See zones of control. Exiting the map. Units which voluntarily or are forced to exit the map may never return. Rail movement. Only German units may use rail movement. Rail movement takes place during the movement phase. To be eligible to move by rail, a unit must begin the movement phase on a rail line outside of enemy zone and control and in supply. During the movement phase, such units may be moved up to 20 hexes along any German rail line. That's massive. It's pretty big. Oh, let, uh, am I uh, out of the full on? No, I could have even gone crazier. There we go. Um, so that's as uh, far out as I could. Wow, fascinating. Should I go back to But anyway, as you can see, there's a lot of rail going on here. I'll go back so you can maybe see. Hold on. How's that? Oops, sorry. Oh, I really hit it too, no, didn't I? There we go. All right. Yeah, I don't think you can barely even... Oh, there we go. I don't... Yeah, okay. Anyway, shush. 
Uh, to be eligible during the movement phase, such units may be moved up to 20 hexes along such un uh, any r German rail line. Units moving by rail may not pass through or end their move in an enemy zone of control. They may move no further that turn. Units may not engage in combat in the same turn they move by rail except to defend. Rail capacity. Rail lines are limited in the number of units that they can carry each turn. Single track lines may carry up to one division or its equivalent, see stacking, per movement phase in one direction. Double track lines may carry up to two divisions in one direction or one division in each direction. Stacking. No more than one division or its equivalent may be stacked in a single hex at the end of a movement phase. For purposes of equivalency, two brigades or regiments equal a division. If no other route is available, units may overstack at the end of a retreat directed by the combat results table. The overstacked units, thus uh, those forced into the hex, are placed under the original units in the hex. While overstacked, they may not attack and they may not contribute to the defense of the hex if attacked. They do suffer any combat results against it, however. At their first opportunity, the owning, the owning player must relieve their overstacked situation. Now we get the zones of control. The six, the six hexes immediately surrounding a unit or stack of units are called controlled hexes and constitute the unit or stack of units zones uh, z or stack of units zone of control the zoc units must stop upon entering an enemy zone of control and may move no further that movement phase units may never move directly from one enemy controlled hex to another where opposing z uh, enemies uh, where opposing zones of control overlap in a hex the hex is considered enemy controlled for both sides. A unit forced to retreat into or through an enemy controlled hex is eliminated unless the hex is occupied by a friendly unit. Such paths may not be traced through an enemy controlled hex unless the hex is occupied by a friendly unit. Thus, for purposes of retreat and supply, the presence of friendly units in a hex negates enemy zone of control. And then I'm going to pause it and just for a second because well you won't well you will because I'm going to pause it and then I'm going to I just need to stop for a second. And move the mouse and then I'm just to move the page and and whatnot. Hold on. All right. So supposedly it's resumed. And another thing I think I can probably tell you by now, or you guys have figured out. I'll never get a job read, or it won't last very long reading, uh, getting a job reading for audiobooks. Oh my God. Jesus Murphy, mother of God. Anyways, now let's go to combat. It's that little bit here, and then I'm going to switch the page. So, combat. Combat takes place between adjacent opposing units at the discretion of the phasing player. Attacking is completely voluntary. The phasing player is. Considered the attacker. Anyway, there we go. There we go. Uh, sorry, I gotta change it now. There we go. The other, the defender. The facing player designates which of their units will participate in attacks against adjacent hexes containing enemy units. They then total the combat strengths strengths of the attacking units brought to bear against def the defending hex and compare the sum to the sum of the defending combat strengths in, in the hex. The comparison is stated as an odds ratio. There we go. Hold on, I gotta get back to where the hell I was. Oh, there we go. One to one, two to one, etc. Indicating um, a column, uh, a column on the combat results table. 
A die is then rolled to achieve a randomized result. This result is applied immediately before any other attacks are resolved. The phasing player may resolve attacks in any order they wish. Advance at, okay, and then uh, you'll see what the, uh, these are the results. Excuse me. Uh, advance after combat. When it, oh, sorry. Uh, and then we've got, to, no, he doesn't have them here. So we have the AR, or sorry, NE, which is no effect. Hold on, I'll move it over. There we go. AR, all attacking units retreat, the indicated number of hexes. DR, uh, Leo may start meowing. Hey, puss. Uh, DR, all defending units, same as above. DE, all defending units are eliminated. And odds less than 1, 2, not allowed. Over th uh, 7 to 1, treated as 7 to 1. Odds are rounded off in the defender's favor. In other words, 20 attack factors versus uh, 11 defender is a 1 to 1 attack. Okay. Uh, hello, puss. And now we're going to go to the uh, advance after combat. And I'll go back to this bit. Here we go. <clears throat> Whenever a combat result calls for defending units to vacate a hex, the attacking units up to a stacking limits may occupy the hex. This must be done before any other attacks are resolved. Retreats. Many combat results call for units to retreat a specified number of hexes. The owning, owning player retreats their units but under the following restrictions. Retreated units must end their retreats the indicated number of hexes away from the hex they vacated. In other words, units may not double back. 2. Retreated units must attempt to end their re retreats in a hex. And then, sorry, they've got a double thing here. In a hex, in a hex, nearer to a supply source than the one they vacated. For this purpose, German supply sources are the West Map Edge and Konigsberg. So, hold on. So, as we know, Konigsberg's way over there. There we go. And uh, yeah, I've got the zoomy bit, but you get the idea. You've been here before. All right. Uh, where the heck was I here? For this purpose, German supply sources are the West Map Edge and Konigsberg, and the East and South Edges for the Russians. Supply. Uh, there we go. Oh, I love the Landstrom, what they've done with that. Anyways, uh, supply. There are two supply states, supplied and unsupplied. The supply state of each unit is determined in the supply judgment phase and remains in force for the remainder uh, rest of that turn. Units which are unsupplied have one subtracted from their movement factor and attack at half strength, round fractions down. They defend normally. German supply. German units are supplied if they can trace a path of hexes unobstructed by enemy units or their zones of control back to a German rail line which leads also unobstructed either, either to the west edge or Konigsberg. Russian supply. Russian supply varies. To be in supply for the first six game turns, Russian units must be within six hexes of a Russian rail line leading, leading unobstructed to the east or south edges. And there's not a lot. Um, I'll try to zoom out again. Hold on. There. So you can see there's not a whole hell of a lot. You can see where the border is. So you've got that one up there. They've got to stay within six. There's another one. There's another one. And another one way the heck down there. That's it. So their entire ar uh, two armies have to, s uh, all their forces have to stay within six for. Uh, what did he say here? Hold on, let's get back to that again, so I'll make sure I get it right. <clears throat> Russian supply varies. To be in supply for the first six game turns. 
Russian units must be within six hexes of a Russian rail line leading, leading un unobstructed to the east or south edges. Beginning on turn seven, which is, for our world, is one, two, three, four, five, six, August 23rd. Um, this restriction is lifted and the German traces supply in the same manner as the Germans via Russian rail lines to the east and south edges. Um, it's still, in other words, it's a good, you got to think about that, especially as the Germans. And um, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's been my problem. I've been very aggressive with the Germans and maybe I've caught myself into, into problems hitting like a brick wall very quick. As in, you know, I should have got, anyways, that's a long, this will be my fourth game, uh, playthrough, so it'll be nice. Cavalry. Although they, although they proved somewhat more useful for reconnaissance on the eastern front than on the western, cavalry units were still rather useless against infantry. To reflect this, whenever cavalry units attack a hex containing infantry units, their combat strengths are halved, round fractions up. Also, whenever a, ca whenever a cavalry unit is faced with an attack by infantry units, Alone, it may re elect to retreat before combat. This is done before any odds are totaled or die roll is rolled. The owning player simply retreats the cavalry unit to hexes under the restrictions given in combat. The attacking player may advance after combat. Now hold on, I'm going to pop it in a little bit. Just a little bit. How's that? There we go. Not full on max, but a bit better than, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know. We'll see. Ah, my Landstrom. I, I just love this little... Uh, when I re read this rule for me, I was like, wow, these guys really... Like when he uh, they talk about in, in the game design, they're like, you know, we really pushed the boat out to try to, you know, uh, painstaking uh, efforts or whatever to, you know, get histori historicity. I was like, this bit here is like, wow, these guys... Uh, anyways, for me. Uh, Landstrom. At the outbreak of the war, the Germans organized... Uh, their Landstrom third line reservists into a sort of uh, local militia operating in groups from of from 50 to 250 men they were entrusted with guarding the rail lines while they could offer little resistance to Russian infantry they proved effective in inhibiting the advance of the cavalry whenever a Russian cavalry unit enters a hex containing a German rail line it must stop and move no further that phase. This restriction applies only German the, during the Russian movement phase and has no effect on retreats. I love it. It reminds me of the old uh, GEV or JEV or GEV or whatever the heck people want to call it. I call it JEV, uh, uh, the Steve Jackson game uh, where you know you have to stop uh, when you hit a stream or whatnot. I just love. Anyways, I love that bit. So now we get into this complicated bit, which is uh, for me the fortifications or took uh, the most complicated I would say of all the rules if you want to put it that way and here's a, here we've got some bits here you can see the um, uh, that's the fortification and then we've also got uh, we got a nice little fort back uh, let's grab a nice little one back here that's actually Konigsberg is a pretty good one to grab obviously because uh, it's got uh, field works there as well so and I'll zoom it in a little bit A little bit more there. There we go. Hopefully that'll help. And then uh, I'll move that off to the side. And how's that? Something like that. Uh, that's, I think should work. Good. All right. There are two basic types of fortifications in the game. There's field work, sorry. These guys here. And forts. These guys here. Forts are further differentiated into detached forts and ring forts. Detached fort, ring fort. Field works represent prepared infantry positions and benefit units defending behind them. Only German units benefit from German field works and only Russians from Russian ones. Field works are permanent and are never destroyed. Units attacked solely through fieldwork hex sides may subtract two from their retreat results. In such cases, a DR1 and a DR2 results in an, an, uh, um, 
and no effect. DR3 would be a DR1, etc. Detached forts represent permanent concrete and steel works with in intrinsic garrisons of infantry and artillery. These garrisons are represented by a defense strength printed on each fort. This factor, I this factor is purely defensive. It may never be used in attack. Forts may defend alone or add their strength to defending units in the hex. Detached forts are those located singly near the center of a hex. And I pointed again. Um, sorry, and I shouldn't have done that because I just lost my bit. Units, uh, may, units may never enter a hex containing an enemy detached fort until that fort has been destroyed. Forts are only destroyed by uh, DE results. All other combat results are NE against forts. Units defending in the same hex as a detached forts, as a detached fort, however, are affected normally by all results. Ring forts, these beauties, are part of, a, of an interlocking defense system. They, they are differentiated from detached forts as follows. Ring forts are those attached to the inner sides of a hex. They may only be attacked through the hex side that they adjoin. A hex, see what I mean? Isn't that beautiful? Uh, oh, um, a hex, any of whose sides contains a ring fort is, is called a fortress hex. Friendly units in a fortress hex are immune to enemy attacks against intact ring fort hex sides. Such a unit may, at the defending player's <coughs> discretion, Add its combat strength to the defense of a single attacked fort hex side. If so, then the unit suffers results normally. Enemy units may advance into an empty fortress hex either through an open hex side or a destroyed fort hex side. Once inside each, once inside each enemy unit may assist an outside attack against a single fort hex side. In this case, the defending fort. Defense at one half strength. Drop the fractions. Now we go to reinforcements. It's just a wonderful. Uh, uh, it's just a wonderful game. Wonderful game. Both sides receive reinforcements during the course of the game. Reinforcements are uh, received at the beginning of the movement phase, <clears throat> before any movement takes place. They may move and fight that turn. Reinforcements may be voluntarily withheld or delayed. If units assigned. If a unit, uh, sorry, they did a, a bit of a mistake here. If units assigned, if a unit's assigned entrance hex is occupied by an enemy unit, it may not enter until the hex is recaptured. The unit which uh, units which appear as reinforcements, the turn they arrive, and the hex in which they appear is found on the turn on the turn record track. And like I said, I'll be using. Um, my oh sorry my thing over here this bit rather than theirs it's just because it's really dinky their 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 thing so it, it just drives me up the tree german reinforcements may use rail movement in the phase they appear there are no replacements in this game initial setup the german player sets up their units first following <clears throat> and here we go Oh, sorry, followed by the Russian. The German player may deploy the following units anywhere in East Prussia. So anywhere in their border zone. And uh, you got to be, you know, be creative. Um, hold on, I'm going to get to the last page here for me too. Um. They get the uh, the initial units are the first, the second, the thirty fifth, the thirty sixth, the thirty seventh, the forty first, uh, the first reserve, the thirty sixth reserve, and the third reserve. Oh, here I'll just pop them on. I'll show you, whatever's. There is a discrepancy. A discrepancy. And I'll talk about this later. There is a discrepancy between the uh, Spence and Gable original uh, German counters and the Excalibur game. Uh, German counters, not the um, Russians. They got the Russians okay, but they did make a screw up with the um, Germans, just a little bit. Not nothing amazing. 
So my counters, I actually have both versions. I have, I can play both versions if you want to call it that. So anyways, and you're going to see later, well, obviously when we get into it, but uh, the Germans over here, like their strength points are, you know, often like 20 strength points for their divisions vers versus the, the highest. Sorry, you can't see it because of the horrible glare, but it's like a 12 strength point. Um, uh, for the the Russians and so on and so forth. So it's not very good at all All right, so I'll just put them off to the side you get the idea and we'll go back to the rules Like I said, I'm still learning how to do all this But hopefully this this turned out somewhat half decent. I hope Oh, sorry, and then I'll zoom back in a bit There we go, maybe that's a bit better And I'll just put them off to the side. Hold on Actually, I gotta move these guys out of the way because we're gonna see some part of where they set up the Russians. So maybe I should have. Uh, here, I'll zoom out again. There we go. And I'll move those guys off too. Well done. Almost done. Good lord. Well, I th uh, a fellow gamer told me that uh, they actually watch quite a bit of my videos at uh, super fast speed to get it over with. <laughs> Good on you, as long as you watch, I guess. Um, anyway, so uh, there's going to be uh, quite a bit of uh, German units, but nowhere near the amount of Russian units. And just like it is, you know, you've seen probably time and time again with many uh, many games uh, with this is, you know, it's quality versus quantity. Um, and the Russian. The Russian player deploys their units in two groups. The first group is deployed on or north of the hex row uh, August, Augusto Lick Allenstein. So it's uh, this bit here. We can see it. Yes, you can. Good. So they can go essentially. Sorry. I'll go about a bit. Yeah. So essentially. The first army can go anywhere uh, this way up north, obviously staying within the in the border, and uh, the second army would be able to go anywhere down here, as you can obviously flow into. But yet again, having to stay within six hexes if you want to get the supply bit. All right, I'll put your thing back there. There we go. Uh, the second group must be deployed south of the of uh, the above hex row and and on or adjacent to the following towns. So, oops, sorry. Um, Australalinka. Where are you? There we go. Right over here. Sorry, I'll bring it over. So here. So the second group must be deployed uh, south uh, of the above hacks row and on or ad adjacent to the following towns. So they have to go to here, here, oh sorry, here, Lomza, Ozevek, or Ozevek, where the heck are you? Over here, wow. That's the second army. The cavalry units are an exception, however, and may be deployed up to eight hexes from Ostrolenka. So, okay, that's not too bad. I think, yeah, I've used them often to try to uh, cause some grief uh, over here. Um, and now we'll get to the scenarios, and we're almost finished. Jeepers jumping. There we go. Maybe I'll bring this in now. Because it's nice to see the designer notes and all that stuff. There we go. How's that? All right. Okay. Uh, scenarios. The following scenarios. Oh, sorry, I missed it there. There we go. The following scenarios represent actual or possible alternatives which could have affected the campaign. So you could try A, the stronger 8th army. This presumes that the Germans had left a larger force to, do, to defend East Prussia. This would likely have had an adverse effect on the Western campaign. 
the Germans receive an, as initial units all units reg regularly scheduled as reinforcements for the September 2nd turn. And um, so what would that have been? That would have been for the Germans, uh, the 22nd, the 38th, the 1st Guard Reserve, the 3rd Guards, and the 8th Cavalry Division coming appearing on the west edge of the map. Um, number two, uh, your second scenario for this game could be, <coughs> excuse me, a stronger second army. During mobilization, the Russians detached several units from the second army to de descend against the Austrians. This presumes they didn't with some possibly bad results in Galicia. The Russians received the following units as initial units for the second army. The first guard, second guard, and the uh, GRF, which, which is what did they say in the, doesn't have it listed here. Hmm, interesting. So guard uh, rifles, I guess, guard rifles. C, better R Russian mobilization is a third uh, scenario you could try as well. Uh, the Russian mobilization was hampered by a poor rail and road network, a shortage of dry, a dry edge and monumental confusion. In the admittedly unlikely chance that these obstacles could have been overcome, the Russians may deploy as initial units for the Second Army all indicated reinforcements up to the August 23rd turn, which probably would be significant. Um, well, they would get the 6th and the 8th, the 2nd, the 22nd, and the 24th, and the 3rd Guard and the 1st Rifles. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, and then there's a fourth scenario that you can even try besides just playing the normal game. Like, come on, pretty impressive, man. Russian, uh, better Russian cavalry. Russian Corps and division, Divisional Cavalry consisted of low-grade Cossack units, units which proved worthless for screening and reconnaissance. Hence the Russians' inability to invert inside East Prussia. Oh my god, I didn't even talk about the setup for inverted units. We completely missed this bit. Oh my goodness. Uh, presuming that the Russian units had been provided with regularly regular cavalry allow Russian units to invert like the German units both in and out of re East Prussia holy smokes Jesus Murphy I miss this compl this would have been a massive thing to miss for the rules um, inverted units all units whether initial or reinforcements are first placed on the map inverted face down Units become uninverted face up in the following ways. German units become un and I love this wrinkle, so I'm so, oh my god, I would have felt horrible. Uh, German units become uninver uninverted whenever they become adjacent to an enemy unit and remain face up as long as they are ad adjacent. When no longer adjacent, they reinvert. Russian units are treated the same as Germans while on Russian, Russian territory. Whenever they move into any border or East Prussian hex, however, they are immediately uninverted and remain so as long as they are in such hexes. Players are always allowed to inspect their own inverted units. They may never inspect their opponents, however. Oh, just, uh, it's just beautiful. Okay, and then we'll go to the addendum, or the addenda, and then... Um, it says the following are additions and clarifications to the preceding rules. German uh, movement restriction. German units may not move outside of East Prussia for the first 10 game turns. They may move to border hexes. Uh, lake all sea hexes. Um, units may not cross lake or all sea hex sides. The only exception is the case of the rail line which crosses a lake arm near Nikolaikin or something. And it's, hold on, I was going to do the robot right here. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh my God, right on. It's right on the spot, like right in the center. This is wicked. Um, where are we here? German units may cross there normally by rail or pay the river crossing movement by foot. Russian units may not cross. Units forced to retreat 
through lake or all sea hex sides are eliminated. Zones of control do not extend across such hex sides, nor may supply paths uh, traced through them. Stacking. Opposing units may never be stacked together in the same hex. Alrighty. And now we're getting down to the last two tiddly bits, and the biggie, the biggie is the design notes. Victory. And their victory actually is pretty darn good. I like this bit. I like their stuff. I like their style, man. And when I, after uh, playing this game, I was like, gosh, like I said, I wanted to figure out if trying to get uh, buy the rights, because I was like, nobody knows about this game. Gall darn it. And, uh, and then I found out they had other games of, for this series kind of thing. I was like, wow, they've got something going on here, man. Um, or did. Or still do, really. Victory. The victory conditions in Tannenberg are basically geographic and reflect the goals which each side was trying to achieve. In other words, the Russians seeking to overrun East Prussia, the Germans to stop them. Victory is determined at the end of the game in the following manner. The Russians achieve a major victory if no supply German units remain on the map east of the Vistula. Hold on here. So let's, can you see? Oh, hold on. Oh, move it. I don't care about my counters for now. There we go. So it says, um, the Russians achieve a major victory if no supply German units remain on the map east of the Vistula. So it's, that's a pretty tall order. Or outside of Konigsberg. So yet again, that's a you know a pretty tall order. Minor victory. Uh, they achieve a minor victory if they have blocked all rail lines between Konigsberg and the west edge, or have more divisions or equivalent inside East Prussia than the Germans. That's pretty cool, man. German. The Germans achieve a major victory if no supplied uh, the German uh, the Germans achieve a major victory if no supplied Russian units remain inside East Prussia. They achieve a minor victory if there is still a rail link between Konigsberg and the West Edge and they have at least as many divisions or equivalent in East Prussia as the Russians. And now we get to the design notes. Uh, Tannenberg is the first of a planned series of games on campaigns and battles of the First World War. These games will use a similar game system, although individual adjustments will be made to reflect the uniqueness of the situation and the changing, changing nature of the war. Members of the series now underway are Sarajevo, Austro-Serbian Campaign of 1914, and Kaiserslaut, Battle for France in 1918. A great deal of research went into, into this game, including several German and Russian sources. Every, every effort has been made to make the game both histor historically accurate and playable. Because historicity has not been sacrificed, it will admittedly be very difficult for the Russian, Russians to achieve a major victory. At the same time, however, the Germans won't find it easy to recreate Hindenburg's victory either. Game design, Richard Spence, and game development, James Gable. Okie doke. So um, hopefully uh, uh, that went somewhat okay. Um, it was probably like uber long. Um, but that's it. And then the next thing will be, I guess I'll, uh, you know, I'll set up. I'll do like a quick uh, counter comparison. That won't be very long video. And... Um, I'll set up the whatever, and then after that, it's just going to be kind of like action now, um, or after action report things. Like, I'm not going to go through it. Like, uh, some, maybe one turn I'll do whatever, like some combats or whatever, but it's not going to be like I'm doing with um, the other stuff. Okay, I hope that went well. And I'm going to hit the stop button and cry a river if it doesn't uh, work. <laughs>